Our lecturer tonight, Jan Turnquist, is executive director of the Orchard House Museum, uh, home of the Alcotts in Concord, Massachusetts, where Little Women was written by Louisa May Alcott in 1868. And uh, when Jan is not actively working as executive director at Orchard House, she is um, taking part as her alter ego, Louisa May Alcott. Many of you may be familiar with her from her many performances, many of which have been here at the Old South Meeting House. So I encourage you to give a warm welcome to Jan Turnquist. Thank you. I met someone here tonight who said her first um, experience attending an event here at Old South was when Louisa May Alcott came out that door and talked about how her carriage had lost a wheel and she was stranded. And <laughs> but the trouble with me is that I have the same relationship with Louisa May Alcott that Clark Kent has with Superman. And I always miss her and I always keep hearing about her. So. I'm glad, though, that you're interested in the Alcotts because, as you can imagine, they're a fairly passionate interest of mine. I think of this family as a window into a time period. I really love history and biography, and I think what a perfect marriage of the two to be able to use a family biography in this case. And, of course, it's not necessarily in a written form, although there's a lot written about the Alcotts. But a lot of the ev evidence that you find about this family is happily physical evidence in their homes. And Orchard House is fortunate to have about 80% all authentic, so that when you walk into that house, you're really seeing what they saw and what they walked out of. So with that in mind, of course, I have slides tonight, many of which will show you the Orchard House and members of the family, and I'll sort of use those as um, an illustration as I talk, but I, it's not limited to what you see here, and if you have questions, uh, we will have a question period at the end, but also if there's something that you really feel is very relevant you want to ask me in the middle, that wouldn't bother me. Um, I do want to tell you that we're getting things now on DVD and PowerPoint, but of course, most nonprofits don't have PowerPoint yet, so I'm back to the old slides, and I don't think the quality is quite up to snuff. We have much better quality on the uh, DVD, so bear with us on the quality for some of these. But I'm going to begin by introducing Amos Bronson Alcott, the father of the family. As many of you know, Little Women is highly autobiographical, but Amos Bronson Alcott is perhaps, the, in some ways, the, the least... Uh, modeled in the book because what he really did was quite different from the father in the family in the book Little Women. The Reverend Mr. March, as you may recall, is a Union Army chaplain in the book Little Women, and he is off serving with the Union Army when he becomes terribly sick, and word comes to the house that, uh, by a telegram that father is very, very ill in Washington City. And so Josephine sells her hair to buy the ticket for Marmy, who gets on the train and goes and brings him home. All of this is autobiographical, but it didn't happen to him. It happened to Louisa May Alcott. And so I'll get into a little bit more of that as we go along. So let me just delve into the real Amos Bronson Alcott for a moment here. He was born in Connecticut to a family that helped to found the city of Walcott, Connecticut. His mother, who is pictured here, must have been a remarkable woman from all that we can gather. She loved learning. But in Walcott, Connecticut, I think she had a very different life from that that she might have imagined. Uh, her brother, for example, Tillotson Bronson, uh, had gone to Yale and became the headmaster at the Cheshire Academy. She did learn a lot from her brother, as women frequently did in those days. That was your primary uh, ticket to an education. But then she married a farmer, settled down, had a very difficult existence. Um, the area where they lived in Walcott, Connecticut, was called Spindle Hill. They were growing flax. The soil was very, very sandy. There wasn't much water up there on that hill. She would, for example, clean her floors by bringing sand in and then scrubbing the sand, sort of like sandpaper, and then sweeping it out. Uh, she would teach her son... Bronson. His name was Amos Bronson, but he liked being called by his middle name. 
She would teach him his letters in the sand. She would make little journals for him because he, of all her children, was probably the most kindred soul to hers. He loved learning, and I think that gave her great joy. So she would make little journals for him from scraps of paper. She'd sew them together, and, you know, the little, little bits of paper that you could salvage that hadn't been written upon. And taught him really to, to appreciate everything that he was given. She would make the ink for him to use. They had two books available in that household, and he read them repeatedly, the Bible and the Pilgrim's Progress. And I think they had an extraordinary relationship. This is Marmy, the mother of the family, really called Marmy, as she is called in Little Women. Now, I'm going to give you an overview to all the family members, and then we'll come back and talk about each of them. Her background was very, very different from Amos Bronson Alcott in that she was born in Boston. And her father, Colonel Joseph May, was quite well-to-do, was a very moral and philanthropically oriented gentleman. One of his business partners, however, was quite the opposite. And when he built some of their uh, clients out of money, and then absconded, her father took his own personal money, which he was not obligated to do according to the way the laws were at that time apparently, and took his personal money to pay back each and every person who had been robbed. So it reduced his income by quite a bit. And thereafter, they were sort of what was politely known as a family of reduced circumstances. But they were not poor by any means. They were comfortable even at that point. But I think all of that is evident in Little Women because that is really the status of the March family in Little Women. If you read it carefully, you, you pick that up. The actual Alcott family was much poorer than the March family in Little Women. And because Louisa was so very familiar with her mother's background, of course, she used that. So all throughout Little Women, you will find the autobiographical pieces being moved around and played with a little bit to fit what she thought would be more acceptable to her readers. But Marmy must have been a remarkable person as well. Louisa once called her the best woman in the world. And one time when a critic said, well, you made Marmy too sweet in Little Women, she said, I couldn't make her half good enough. And I think Louisa really meant that. It's interesting, however, because if you read a lot about this woman and read about other people who knew her well, you do begin to pick up that she had quite a temper. And she had learned to control it quite well, but she was a person that I'm sure some refined ladies of the day might find difficult. I know that during the Civil War, for example, when she would hear news of a battle, she'd sort of come rushing in and talk about it and, and be very um, uh, sort of passionate about it. That was not considered ladylike. You just didn't do that in those days. So I think she was unusual in that way, but she more than made up for it. Even people who found that displeasing, were happy to know her because she was so good-hearted. Hannah in Little Women, the maid in Little Women, I'll make these references, but I'll try to always make it clear for those of you who are not familiar with the book. Hannah is the maid of the March family in Little Women. The real Alcott family did not have a maid when the girls were growing up. They did have boarders, however, so they knew what it was like to have an outside person in the family. And Hannah said at one point, about the mother of the family, Marmy, there never was such a woman for doing good. And I think that is absolutely true of Mrs. Alcott. And when you read some of the charitable activities that the March girls do, like giving away their breakfast, their treasured breakfast, in the book it's Christmas Day. In real life it was New Year's Day, but it was every bit as looked forward to and treasured. They really did that. They gave away their breakfast when Mrs. Alcott came home from discovering that a family was very, very needy. And they moved around a good deal, and yet it didn't take long. Whatever town they lived in, it seemed people learned, if there's someone in need, go ask the Alcotts. They'll find a way to help. It wasn't because they could afford it either. They just found a way. It was because it was in her heart. At various points, they did live in Boston. She was really what we would today call a social worker. She was probably the first paid female social worker. They didn't call it that in those days. She ran a relief room. Various church ladies got together. They were concerned about the Irish immigrant girls who were being mistreated. They were, they were being cheated. They were 
being compromised in many ways by some unscrupulous employers and landlords. And so she ran an intelligence office, as she called it, so that they could come and find out who were the reputable employers and landlords. And she had quite a concern about making sure they could read and making sure that they had dignity. She wrote about this in her diaries. Anyone can worry about feeding the poor, and people do usually worry about that, clothing them. But who worries about what's inside? They need dignity. They need to know that they are worth something, and that just because they're having a hard time now doesn't mean they'll always be that way. And I think that is an extraordinary forward-thinking uh, point of view, and that is true of every single member of this family. As, as we'll go on more, you'll learn more why I say that. This is her brother, Samuel May. And it's very confusing to people because there are two Samuel Mays. They are cousins to each other. They are both abolitionists. They are both ministers. They are both forces to be reckoned with, and they're both quite wonderful characters. So one Samuel May is Abby's brother. By the way, Marmy is actually Abigail May Alcott. One is her brother, one is her cousin. This is the one that is her brother. And as I say, quite an abolitionist. If you look at the timeline back there, you'll see William Lloyd Garrison. And he is one of those characters of history that I think is quite worth reading about if you haven't already. Very few people really understood him the way this man did. He was one of his closest friends. William Lloyd Garrison publishes The Liberator, which is the longest running abolitionist newspaper in this country. He was um, a founder of several abolitionist societies. Bronson Alcott was a charter member of the Abolitionist Society in Massachusetts, and Mrs. Alcott was a charter member of the Female Abolitionist Society. Their oldest child, Anna, is the one who is called Meg in Little Women. Now, I'm going to talk more about her in regard to her wedding, because that is such a part of Little Women. And we may or may not have time to come back to her very much. She, in a sense, is the quietest of the family members, partially because she does take the most traditional path. She marries what she says is a wonderful man. And if you read Little Women, basically when you're reading about Meg and her John Brooke, you're reading about Anna and John Pratt. Here's one of the little quirks. I'll just, I can't tell you all of them, but this is a fun one, and it sort of gives you the pattern for what Louisa did throughout Little Women. John Pratt had relatives who lived at Brook Farm. So, his parents, in fact, at one point. So when Louisa was casting about for a name, she calls him John Brook. She did that throughout Little Women. Little hints at who they were, but she didn't think anyone would ever really figure it out. She didn't expect that book to become famous. This is the wedding certificate, which hangs in the parlor of Orchard House. If you've seen the movie of Little Women, you think they were married outside. In reality, they were married in the parlor at Orchard House. This is the wedding dress, which we still have. And by the way, that Louisa costume that you saw is patterned exactly after this dress. It's very different fabric. And this is where they were married. Now, this is a, um, a little sturdier version of what was described by Louisa on the wedding day. Louisa May Alcott created a sort of bower for her sister to stand under when she was married, and they put it inside the house. So that outdoor wedding isn't so very far from, from how they were approaching it. They have two children, Freddie and Johnny. In Little Women, it's Demi and Daisy, twins, a boy and a girl. In reality, it's not twins, and it's two boys. Louisa May Alcott is the next in line in the family. So Anna's the oldest. She's second to the oldest. Since I'm going to say a lot more about her later, I'm just going to tell you about this particular likeness. This is a painting done by George Healy. It hangs in the dining room of Orchard House. But if you go to another dining room of a very famous house in this country, you will see another George Healy painting of Abraham Lincoln. And I imagine you might be able to guess what dining room you'd be standing in, the White House. George Healy was extremely well-known and talented as a painter. It is a mark of Louisa May Alcott's fame that when she was in Italy traveling, George Healy got wind that she was there, sent word to her hotel, and asked her to pose for him. She agreed. Later, the painting was sent to her home in Concord, Massachusetts, and she was very disappointed. She thought it should be hung behind a door. You can see that she doesn't look 
perhaps her best. You see the, the sort of drawn bags under the eyes kind of look. She's not that old, but this is the effects of the illness. She was actually 36 when she wrote Little Women. This was painted just a couple years after that. She's probably not yet 40 when this was painted. And if you look at the difference between her, her photograph taken before she went to serve as a nurse and this painting, it's really shocking how much she aged in that short amount of time. But she had typhus and pneumonia and was treated with calomel, which is mercurous chloride. And so she has suffered the effects of mercury poisoning. So I really think she uh, suffered the rest of her life. And it's quite miraculous, really, all that she accomplished while struggling with all of these debilitating factors. The next one in line in the family is Elizabeth. She is the one who died, as people will say. I, one of our guides one time said, well, they all died. <laughs> But because of Little Women, everyone knows Elizabeth dies in Little Women, and it's extremely sad, and that is exactly how it happened. What, what is written about the Elizabeth March character is very, very close to what happened to Elizabeth Alcott. She was very shy. She was very young. In, in reality, she was just a little older than, than is said to be in the book, but that's because Louisa took their young years and moved them up into wartime. That was another one of the... Um, changes that she made. And I'll tell you a little more of the reasons for that as we go along. The youngest one in the family is Abigail May Alcott, but following her father's um, model, she likes to be called by her middle name, May. And if you transpose two letters in that name, May, the first two letters, you come up with Amy. And so that is the character in Little Women. That's the only one she happened to do that for, but it's sort of fun to know. This is an extremely talented young woman. Um, she travels to Europe to study art. She has a roommate who paints this painting of her. Her roommate is Rosa Peckham. If only we had time. I often joke with people, I, if I had a week, <laughs> and if you all had sleeping bags and a good supply of food, I could keep going. I will restrain myself from telling you about Rosa Peckham, but that in itself is an interesting story. And think of it, two young females traveling to Europe to study art. Again, if you just put yourself into the sensibilities of the 19th century, that is very unusual that their parents allowed it. This is obviously a talented roommate she had, too, because that's quite a lovely likeness of May. May does marry a young man while she's in Europe named Ernst Nieriker, and they have a darling little girl that they name Louisa May Nieriker, nicknamed Lulu, and she grows up to be quite a lovely young woman. Um, she does come to this country, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment, and then goes back to Europe. So she has a very interesting perspective on the living all cuts but yet she grew up in Europe, so she has European sensibilities. A very interesting person in her own right, and really sort of our lifeline to a lot of direct information that, that is not necessarily published, although some of it corroborates published information. But what I wanted to show you before I leave May and then get into some more facts about the family in general, is this sculpture, because May Alcott taught the man who sculpted this. This is Bronson Alcott, sculpted by Daniel Chester French. Dan French was carving turnips and other vegetables from the garden when someone said, you know, he's pretty talented. Why don't you get May Alcott to give him some clay? Which she did, not realizing that he didn't know anything about it. And he came back to her telling her it didn't work very well. It just crumbled. And she explained that you have to wet it. And, gave him some of her art tools and some lessons, and she also was teaching art at that time in Concord. Obviously, Dan was a good pupil, had a lot of talent, went quite far. In case you don't know this, he, his first commission piece is the Minuteman statue at the North Bridge in Concord, and his last large commission piece was the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. 
for which, by the way, he made sure to use one of May's art tools that she had originally given him because he adored her. He thought she was wonderful. He was 15 years younger than she was, and I think he really kind of had a crush on her. I want to show you some other pieces of her artwork. I'll just kind of go through these because if I took a lot of time, we wouldn't make it through. But this just shows you some of her variety of work. You saw sketches, watercolors, some done in Europe. I think this is a particularly lovely one. It hangs in the parlor. All of these, by the way, that you're seeing hang in Orchard House today. That one's a little hard to see. This is an interesting one in that if you go into the home of Ralph Waldo Emerson, you will see Endemion, this is what this painting is named, hanging in his, I believe it's in the dining room now. Um, May Alcott borrowed that painting and then copied it at home and did that a lot with Ralph Waldo Emerson's paintings and sketches. He was very generous. Louisa did that a lot with his books. And when you read the wonderful description in Little Women of Joe March going into the library of Mr. Lawrence. Oh, what riches. And she just looks around and is so in rapture. I believe that had to be Louisa at Ralph Waldo Emerson's library because of everything she says about him. I think this one is quite lovely. This hangs in Louisa's bedroom. And May wrote a letter home to her sister where she sketched this owl and said, he reminds me of you, Louisa. I'm going to put him in a painting one day. She had bought the owl, by the way, in a junk shop in Paris. This painting was critiqued later by John Ruskin, who was a very well-known art critic and educator, a very well-known figure of the 19th century. He commented that May Alcott's pages of a book in this painting were amongst the best he had ever seen. So I believe that May was really honing her art, and we would have heard so much more about her had she lived longer. This, again, is one of her later works we're getting now. You can see the difference in, in the works as we move along. Not that the other ones weren't good, but this one I just wish we had in better quality. We have a, a likeness of it in the uh, study right now in the Orchard House. It won't stay there. But this one is called La Grass. She asked a Parisian model to pose for it. But obviously she was thinking of her abolitionist background. This family had been involved with the Underground Railroad and had lived very risky lives at certain points. I don't know. I mentioned William Lloyd Garrison a little bit earlier. Do you know about the, what they call the Garrison Riots? At one point, there was a mob in Boston that was determined to find William Lloyd Garrison and tar and feather him because of the salacious writings in The Liberator. They thought he just went too far. And his point of view was, you want me to be moderate on the topic of abolition? Would you ask a woman to be moderate on the topic of saving her child from the flames into which it has fallen? And that was his take on it, when people would try to get him to tame himself. So the Alcotts helped him to escape right in the middle of Boston. They were in the thick of things. That had to have made an impression on all of their children. And May Alcott, even though she was the youngest and the least aware, I'm sure, of all of this type of activity, the attitude, the stories were always with her. And it's fascinating. If, if you can just focus on those eyes, you see the sadness and everything they felt about abolition and reform in general is really in this painting. Here is the family in front of Orchard House. We're fortunate to have some wonderful old photographs. And the plot plan drawn by Henry David Thoreau, their very close family friend. It's very hard to see, but I will point out just briefly. The little square that I pointed to first was a two over two house. And that's what Bronson Alcott was purchasing in 1857 when he bought 12 acres of land in Concord, Massachusetts on the Lexington Road, which was the main road into town. It's the road that the British soldiers marched down when they were on the way to find the stores in 1775. Behind it were outbuildings. Bronson Alcott felt that a little two-room over two-room structure was way too small for his family, so he took all the outbuildings, with the help of Henry Thoreau, by the way, and rolled them down the hill and made his home bigger. Most of the house, therefore, was really added onto in this fashion and just sat on bare earth. From 
even earlier than 1857 because the Orchard House itself dates from the late 1600s, those front two rooms. And one of the outbuildings, at least, is at least that old as well, we believe, based on some of the architectural uh, findings recently. So for 300 years, you have these buildings sort of sitting there on the bare earth. This is one of the reasons we have such dire conditions at Orchard House now. That's just not a good way to preserve wood, to just let it sit on the bare earth. We now have dug a foundation, mostly by hand, under all of that part of Orchard House. So today, if you come down the Lexington Road, this is what you would see. And the interior photographs, some of them are a little bit different today because the, the staircase has been repainted. But I just want to give you a little feeling and talk a little bit more about the family and, and what was behind this book, Little Women, because Little Women was set in Orchard House. And the order of some of these slides has been changed, uh, but it doesn't really matter too much if you just will bear with me. That front entry would lead you into the parlor. There is a different rug in the parlor now because we were fortunate to restore both the parlor and the study to exactly the way they looked in 1875. When the family moved in in 1857, they were terribly poor and they had straw mats on the floor. The straw mats, of course, were worn away many, many years ago. But we have the records and even little slivers of the samples of the carpeting that Louisa May Alcott was able to purchase for her family after she made money from Little Women. Little Women was published in 1868. So by 1875, they really start to become quite comfortable, but it's because of her. And remember, she was 36 years old when she wrote that book. So it's well after the struggling years that the Little Women would depict. So you will see a bright green carpet in this room if you come in today. Otherwise, it will look the same. And you notice the fireboard that was sketched by May Alcott. All throughout the house, on fireboards, on window um, boards, all over the place, May Alcott sketched or painted right on the wood of the house. And when people talk about saving the artifacts in Orchard House, some of them are the house. This is a view from the parlor into the dining room. Many, many of the plays that the real Alcott girls put in, similar to how the March sisters put on plays in Little Women, took place in that dining room where the audience would be sitting from this vantage point in the parlor. They would put a curtain up in between. And if you remember in Little Women, Rodrigo, Josephine March wears boots and pants and she's brandishing a sword. Louisa played that part. Certainly many, many of those things were done when they were very young and they lived in quite a variety of homes. But even when they were older and moved into Orchard House, they were still putting on plays here. By the way, I should probably explain to you at this point why they moved around so much. They moved frequently more than once in a year. In, in the first 20 years of their family life, they moved 23 times. That is why, by the way, Louisa May Alcott decided to set Little Women in Orchard House. It's where she was living when she wrote the book. It was just a lot simpler. How on earth could she describe all those moves? And how could she describe her father? He was a remarkable man who believed in his ideals so strongly that he would never compromise a principle for the sake of earning money, hence the poverty. They sat around their dining room table with their father and talked about all the issues of the day. They were very active reformers. And in the brochure, it mentioned um, the uh, women's rights suffrage. Uh, this was a very important matter for this family. But they sided with Lucy Stone. I don't know if you understand that, that um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucy Stone sort of split the American women's suffrage uh, party because when the 15th Amendment was proposed and the question was, shall the newly freed male slaves be allowed to vote, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were pretty upset that, that the, these new freed male slaves were going to vote before the women. The women had been working on this for a long time, and here are more men getting the vote. Whereas Lucy Stone and the Alcotts felt that we should work together. And who cares who gets it first? We're not stopping until we have universal suffrage. So let's just work together. This is one of those very little known facts of history. And I frankly kind of think the Alcotts had it right, but 
that's just my prejudice once again. But this is where these kind of discussions took place around this table. And when they didn't have much to eat, they had what they called vegetarian wafers. They would have little sayings or little proverbs or little topics to discuss. And so, and because they were vegetarian, I think that's just why they called it that, so that they were expected to get some of their sustenance from the talk and, and the feelings within themselves as much as from the food. Beth's little melodeon, that is the likeness of Beth above it. Another view of the dining room. By the way, in that cabinet is Mrs. Alcott's English Coalport China. That is a legacy from her rather wealthy family. And she would say that they would always be a respectable family, even when they were very poor, because they had their fine china. And the kitchen. Louisa once said that all the philosophy in our house does not take place in the study, where, of course, her father reigned. A good deal of it takes place in the kitchen, where a fine old lady thinks high thoughts and does kind deeds as she cooks and scrubs. And I like to think about that when, when I look at this kitchen. This is the soapstone sink that Louise May Alcott purchased for her mother. It would have been a real luxury in about 1870 or so when it would have been purchased. And they had a pump that came right up into the sink. Later they did have running water put in, but it was attached to a, a reservoir. There was no run, water coming in from the town. But those were luxuries um, that the family really appreciated. Now this is the study I just referred to. And Bronson Alcott did sit in this study hours upon end, reflecting, writing, meeting with Emerson and other dignitaries of the day. Today it does look different because once again we did have the opportunity to restore that study to look the way it did in 1875 when the Alcott's redid it. So you will see a wonderful red carpet on that floor now. This is Bronson in his study and this is one of the ways that we can have provenance on the items and uh, on the collection and be able to um, replace them. His motto, which I'm sure you can't read, but it's just wonderful to see because May Alcott painted it. It says, think for a moment of God's hands, its creation, and remember that to rear is to bring up. The hills are reared, the seas are scooped in vain. If learnings alter, vanish from the plain. Now I mentioned that Bronson Alcott had very high ideals. Primarily, his high ideals connected with education. In his early years, he taught young children, but he didn't believe that they would learn as well if they were being beaten. And many, many of the people of the day, the parents and the teachers, felt that if you spared the rod, you spoiled the child. So there was Bronson Alcott refusing to beat the children. He allowed questions in the classroom. That was certainly upsetting to people who thought that would simply promote rudeness. Children had to learn to be seen and not heard, and they should only speak when called upon to recite. He allowed books and decorative elements in the classroom and took his own money to provide these when the school committee or parents said, that's ridiculous, we're not funding that. Eventually, it seemed he always had to close his school and move on, and there were always different reasons. At one point, it was because of a negress that he allowed in the classroom. Abolitionist parents didn't want their children going to school with a negress. Of course, this was well before the war, and it was illegal in, in many places to educate uh, a slave or former slave or anyone of color. So Bronson Alcott, again, refused to compromise his ideals, and when the paying parents withdrew their children and this little negress, Susan Robinson, was left along with his daughter, there was no one to pay because Susan was a charity pupil, as they used to call it. So Bronson Alcott was constantly finding himself in a position to need to move and start a new school or start some other venture. Many of you probably know about their, their um, very interesting experiment at Harvard, Massachusetts, called Fruitlands, a utopian society. Here is the dear old philosopher himself. Louisa often called him Plato. And uh, they had a wonderful relationship. People often uh, sort of hone in on the part of Bronson Alcott that was not providing for his family and some of his other unusual ideas. And they think that 
well, that was insufferable, and how could he treat his family that way? And he himself would, would hold himself accountable in that way and think that it wasn't good for his family. On the other hand, he allowed his girls freedoms that some parents wouldn't have allowed boys, and he allowed them to see themselves as, selves as individuals. Louisa did adore him. She would get frustrated by him at times. So would her mother sometimes. Her mother would say, a philosopher's like a man in a balloon, ever wafting upward. Somebody has to hold the ropes. That was frustrating, and yet they also admired him. Emerson said he was the foremost genius of the day. So he was certainly someone that could evoke emotions in people in all directions. He also loved little projects. He was never lazy. When people think, oh, he didn't provide for his family because he, he sat around and drank or something, the opposite is true. He was very hardworking, but it's just that some of his hard work wasn't going to bring in financial gain. He made this little gazebo out of little saplings that he soaked in the stream and then bent, and this was in the backyard of Orchard House. He did a much more elaborate one in the backyard of the Emerson House, of course, neither of these structures has survived, but there are a good many sketches of them and some photographs of them, and they're quite talked about. Mrs. Emerson wrote, how nice of Mr. Olcott to build us that house for the mosquitoes. Something else he founded was the Concord School of Philosophy. This stands just behind Orchard House today. Many people mistakenly think it's the barn. It was never a barn. It was built to be a school of philosophy, one of the first adult education programs in this country. This is an interior of that, and this is a sketch of what it looked like in Bronson's day. Again, I know that's hard to make much out, but it just gives you the flavor. It was very exciting that it was started. Now, I do want to, this is where I meant the, what I meant when I said the slides were a little bit out of order. I wanted to talk about Bronson Alcott, but I didn't get you upstairs. So we're gonna have a quick look up there. This is the master bedroom of Orchard House. Marmy would often take the girls in and have little chats with them in there, just like the Marmy of Little Women. And the nursery, which is right behind it. Bronson built that for his grandsons when Anna lost her husband. And this was the kind of man that he was. He was constantly trying to be very hands-on and helpful, and he loved helping to raise children, including his grandsons. His order of indoor duties illustrates that as well. You, I don't know if you can see, 5 a.m., rise, bathe, and dress. He has words to live by at the bottom that don't really show up on here, such as um, observe silence and stillness, work, studies, and play distinct, prompt, cheerful, unquestioning obedience. I mean, he sounds like he really has an iron hand on those girls, and yet he allows them to have play. There are periods of recreation, and when they have their periods of recreation, they are allowed to run free where other parents would say to their children, girls don't run. It's not ladylike. You sit and do your needlework. So they had freedom. They had structure, and they had freedom. This is May Alcott's bedroom. If you see the configuration of Orchard House, you'll understand more of why this makes sense, but that's where they would have their costume changes when they were putting on plays down in the dining room. The boots that are leaning up there are the actual boots that Louisa May Alcott wore when she played the role of Rodrigo, and they are referred to in the beginning of Little Women as boots which steal the show. We still have the boots, and although you can't see it, if you are in Orchard House, you'll see a, a little sketch of Louisa wearing those boots playing the role of Rodrigo. And then, of course, May sketched all over the walls of her bedroom with her father's permission. Again, you think of some parents saying, why, that's not allowed. You can't do that. But she was talented. Now, I've saved this for the last because Louisa May Alcott is where I want to come back and talk about some of the connections. This is her bedroom. Her sister painted an owl over the fireplace. You begin to gather sort of an owl theme here. We also have an owl inkwell, and then that owl painting that I showed you a little earlier where the owl is sitting on the books. Louisa did love owls. That little desk where she wrote Little Women was built for her 
in an era when it would be considered improper for a woman to have a desk of her own. There were physicians who actually wrote that brain work would destroy a woman's health. So once again, think about what kind of a father would build a desk for his daughter. Later, when Louisa becomes famous, here she is in the room at Orchard House. And again, when you have a better likeness of this photograph, you can see so many elements that are identical. She is sitting at a different desk, however. This was actually, we believe, a publicity photo that her publisher wanted her to take because she became very famous very fast because of Little Women. And of course, it was followed by Little Men. I don't have a photograph of all the books she wrote after that, but I'll tell you just a few. The three that go together are Little Women, Little Men, and Joe's Boys, although there's a huge time lag between Little Men and Joe's Boys. Little Women and Little Men are right together, 1868 and 1870. And then a lot of years go by, and eventually she writes Joe's Boys to complete this, this story of the March family. But in between Little Men and Joe's Boys, she wrote many other children's books. She wrote adult books. She wrote a lot. But some of the children's books that you will recognize, I'm sure, will be Eight Cousins, Rose in Bloom, Under the Lilacs, Old Fashioned Girl, Jack and Jill, many short stories, poetry. She also wrote some adult books you may know. She wrote Hospital Sketches based on her nursing experience during the Civil War. She wrote Work, a story of experience, which was based on the struggles of a woman trying to make a living in a culture that says, you don't need to do that. She really understood the plight of all kinds of women. And the last scene in that book work is very moving. I, I hope you'll, some of you that are really interested will take a look at least at the last scene, if not the entire book, because you have a variety of women, one of whom is a freed slave and another one has been a prostitute. I mean, you just have all kinds of women and they, they all put their hands together at the end, sort of pledging this unity and we will work together. And once again, that's very much what this family was like, whether they're talking about abolition and, and suffrage and let's work together and get universal suffrage, not just female suffrage, whether they're talking about helping new immigrants, Every reform of the day, dress reform, diet reform, the rights for women, the votes, the abolition. They, really, Louisa actually used to sign some of her letters, yours for reforms of all kinds, L.M. Alcott, because that was the heart of this family. It, they were so socially active. And if someone needed something, remember how I talked about people just knew knock on the door of the Alcotts? They just weren't afraid of risking their own safety, whether it was a runaway slave or a woman who was being beaten and had no recourse because a husband had a right to beat his wife. But some men were worse than others. I don't think anyone could stomach that at all today under any circumstance, but it was tolerated very well by almost everyone. But some women were almost being beaten to death and realized it and wanted to escape. Today we have all kinds of shelters. Then there was nothing except just people who would risk their own families and that the Alcotts were like that. But of course you don't hear about that because it was very quiet. I just wanted to uh, conclude with this because Bronson Alcott and all the family members benefited so much from fame. Louisa felt it was very much a two-edged sword and she was right. She was thrilled to see that Alcott sinking fund begin to rise because of her writing. But it was difficult to have people come up the walkway, knock on her door, and expect an autograph. This is her home. <laughs> and they just would come and expect it, not realizing that she was getting no work done. She writes at one point that she had had 38 visitors that week. That's just ridiculous. How was she going to get any work done? She really missed her privacy. But notice here, remember I said, Amos Bronson Alcott, there's an O in the middle of his name, but here it's misspelled. You, you, I don't know if you can read it well. Alcott, that would mean Mr. Alcott. At the Universalist Church, Friday evening, January 15th, 1875. So he's on a lecture circuit. The conquer, the, um, uh, I can't quite make out the next line myself, but it's a literary entertainment. And then they say, Dr. Brunson Alcott, misspelling his name, it's an honorary doctorate. The conquered sage and gifted sire of... And then in big letters, Louisa M. Alcott will give a conversation. When asked about that, Bronson Alcott was delighted. He was so proud of what his daughter did. And she sort of brought full circle this unusual way that this family stuck together and helped each other. 
And that concludes the slide portion, and we can have a little time for some questions and sort of knit some things together because there's always more to say about the Alcotts, their friends, their time period. Are there some questions? I don't know if you could hear. She wondered why one book of Little Women back there is about 200 pages and the other is about 400 pages. There are two different possibilities. I haven't looked at what's back there. There are abridged versions. It could be that. But the other uh, possibility is that it might be the first half of Little Women because when it was originally published in 1868, it was only what today we would call part one. It, was, it ended before any of them married. Then she wrote part two. She was asked to write it because it was so popular immediately. And part two was published separately as Little Women Part Two or Good Wives. If you go to England, you still would buy it always, I think, in two parts. I don't think they ever put it together. But in this country, part one and part two were put together and then just given the title Little Women. And that is most often how you see it in this country. Once in a while, I think just to be different, some publishers will go back to the original two-part format, but that's pretty rare now in this country today. I mean, yeah. Good Wives, the second half was called Good Wives or Little Women Part Two. The two boys that, I don't know if you were here when we saw the two boys, Freddie and Johnny, one of them, they actually there aren't any all-cut descendants through this family, obviously, because they were all female, right? But um, one of them did have progeny that still actually live in Concord today, but their names just are not related at all to these names because of the... And, and uh, also, I should just tell you, May also, her daughter also had a, a daughter, and there is progeny in Europe through May. So there are relatives that are sort of collateral relatives that still live today and then we're in touch with. We're in touch with all of them. Yes, Louisa was unmarried and Joe March was intended to remain a literary spinster, as Louisa would put it. Her publisher, remember now that was part one. None of them were married at the end of part one. So as she's getting ready now to write part two, this discussion comes up with her publisher, and she explains that she's planning to keep Joe March as a you know, single woman. And her publisher feels that Joe is the heroine of the book, and the heroine of the book must marry. The girls would just be entirely too disappointed. And they sort of go back and forth Everyone thought Laurie was the perfect husband for Joe. And Louisa's attitude was sort of, yes, Laurie would be perfect for Joe, and that's why I won't do it. She just felt nothing in her life was perfect. And she, she would call herself things like topsy-turvy. She saw herself as often not fitting in and not meaning to be a problem, but sort of considered odd and a problem by certain people, especially in her youth. She just couldn't have that perfect ending. So ultimately she compromised and she created Professor Bear and put a lot of his teaching ideas and educational philosophy uh, out of taking that model from her father, put her father's teaching ideas into Professor Bear. And he's based on more than one person. Louisa frequently does this. She'll take more than one person when she's creating a character. So. He has a microphone for you. How long did they live out at Fruitlands, out six in Harvard? Six months. Hmm? At Fruitlands in Harvard, they lived six months. In total? Yes. It was a tough go. <laughs> it, it was an attempt at a utopian society. It was very, very difficult. They started in June, and by December it was clear it wasn't going to make it, and they disbanded it. The Alcotts moved out of that farmhouse and lived in Still River, which, well, it was called Still River then, it's really part of Harvard now. 
um, for a time. They lived with some, some friends for a little while, so they didn't leave the area right away, but they, they did abandon the utopia and they did move out of the farmhouse. But it's such an interesting chapter in history because of the fact that they were starting Utopia that for many people, they, they just assume, well, they lived there for years. That's where they grew up, isn't it? But really, they were just there six months. Uh, thank you. I just wondered if, because most, I realize you're dealing with the uh, old orchard farm at, in Concord. Orchard House. Orchard House, excuse me. But if uh, you might have had any slides of the residences where the Alcotts lived in on Beacon Hill. I don't have slides. I think that is an excellent idea. I think we should do that. Because it's just that other places, they might not, if you gave the talk, they might not have been so interested. I didn't even realize it until I took, I took a woman, women's literary tour. And the leader was a lady. Uh, a, a substantial group of us went around and uh, I believe, the, if I remember correctly, the leader said that Louisa May Alcott had lived over on uh, Pinckney Street, and mm -hmm. she was she had enough, uh, she made enough to uh, support her parents in a very lovely house on uh, Lewisburg Square. Ten Lewisburg Square. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a plaque on it. Ten, mm -hmm. ten Lewisburg Square. Very, uh, there's very a plaque. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's a private residence, but there's a plaque. Um, I think that's an excellent idea. In fact, I, I thought that it would be quite interesting to, to sort of document all these houses, some of which don't exist today, but they certainly had a lot of them. It would be interesting. Of course, the focus today was, was the family behind Little Women, which is since it was set and written there and since I'm there it, and have the slides. That's um, I was wondering if you could just maybe clarify some stuff about Footlands. Um, I understand that after that episode in Bronson Alcott's life, he went into a, a very uh, deep state of depression. And um, that it, it might have been, I don't know how old Louisa was at that age, but I... She was 10. Well, she had just turned 11. Um, I, I'm just trying to see if I have my facts right. Was it... Might it have been at that point in her life where she really saw that her family was always going to be in a state of um, struggle and that she, didn't she start to work or go out and work to earn money for the family or was she too young at that age? Not at that age. In fact, what happened after that, as life often sort of does, there are ups and downs, they did have a period of time that, that was almost idyllic, that I don't think she would have realized all of, of the severity of their situation. They bought a house in Concord and really were able to make it quite large. Once again, Bronson taking out buildings and moving them around. He took a barn, cut it in half, put it on the house, sort of like earmuffs. <laughs> this, would have been the, this would have been after... Uh, right after Fruitlands. Not, not immediately after, but soon after. Was it Emerson that helped... Pay that, the way was, for that? that was when they bought Orchard House, which is even just a little later on. So, Where did he get the money, though, after, after he... After Bronson was often, in these kind of situations, borrowing money. Let me go back just for a moment to okay. the depression moment, because that is interesting. He was very depressed. He had been... Remember, I mentioned how ideal, idyllic, uh, idealistic he was. He really believed, at the point where they started Fruitlands, that man could reach perfection. You just had to really work at it. And so we will start a perfect society. That's this utopia. We will be the city on the hill. The world will gradually get better and better. I mean, he was really believing, not that he could do all of this, but he could start the spark where we would end war and poverty and all sorts of maltreatment. You just, all you have to do is give the example and draw people in, and the goodness of it all will make it happen. He believed all of that. And when the little group at Fruitlands couldn't agree on things, and there was such rancor within their own little community, it was devastating to him. It, it was the highest ideal. He had sort of risked everything for this, and there it was failing. And the man who was the closest partner in this venture with him, Charles Lane, had financed it. And Charles Lane had come to believe, very much like the Shakers, who, by the way, were a very strong presence in Harvard, Charles Lane believed, well, you've got to be celibate. 
Now, this is a married man with four girls and a wife still right there who hadn't planned this. So it was just changing everything in their family. And that's really a horrible, right-at-the-gut kind of rift. And Lane had the money. So ultimately, Bronson stood by his family, but he just felt completely bereft of where, where was he? The rug had been pulled out from under him philosophically and really in his heart. He turned his face to the wall, they said, and he wouldn't eat, and he was just very, very depressed. One day, without any warning, he said, hope. And he began to eat again, and he kind of came back. He was never as idealistic again, although he was always still what we would call an idealist. But he began to, to just sort of rally and think of somebody else he could borrow from and something else he could do, and he'd chop wood, and he'd teach school. He just kept cobbling it together, and they would buy these horrible old houses that were just sort of thrown in with the land. Or sometimes they would rent, or sometimes they would live with someone else who would say, well, we've got some space. Come on and move in here. Thanks. So, does that answer it pretty well for you? Mm -hmm. There's yeah, always I, more. I'm sorry. It's yeah. just such a complicated family. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I, I know our time is pretty much up. Is there any burning question? I'd, or, you know, maybe I can chat for a moment individually. And we can, because I know some people probably have to go. Thank you so much. Come and visit Orchard House.